Great to be here. We've been here for, I guess, almost three months now. And um, there was a lot of uncertainty surrounding our trip. New state, a new city, new job, new school for Cadrian, a new church. Uh, but it's been really great to have to have found this place and you all. I've gotten to know many of you and I'm really looking forward to get to know all of you um, and working with you here um, for the Lord, worshiping with you, studying Bible with you. I've learned so much already and it it's really has been a blessing. I was talking earlier with Fred. I think I got that right. I get Fred, Mike and Mark mixed up, but I was yeah, with Fred talking about the 49ers game. Uh, last week, they, they went against the Packers, and it came right down to the wire. The 49ers went up, took the lead with like 30 seconds left, and everyone went crazy. But anyone who's watched the Packers knows it's like 30 seconds might just be a, too much time for Aaron because too often he's drove down the field with hardly any time left and made it happen to come back with a win. A very exciting game. Yesterday, Kadrian and I went to the Stanford game. We saw Stanford play Oregon, who is ranked number three in the country. Stanford's not ranked, hasn't had the best football season to even to date. Stanford won that game. With a minute and a half left in the game, Stanford was down by a touchdown. And they had to score a touchdown to go into overtime and eventually win in overtime. And anyone watching that game with a minute and a half left, Kadrian was with me, and I was like, they got the ball on the, their own 14. The first play, they I think they gained two yards, and then they had two consecutive penalties. They were backed up. It was second and 20, and they had to drive 96 yards from their own four-yard line. And I told Kadrian, our train's coming in 15 minutes. If they don't get this, we're heading out. Anyone looking at that game, you, you think to yourself, what are the chances that Stanford actually wins this game? I'm so glad we stayed. If you had looked at their previous play and thought, you know, Based on how they've played before, there's no way that they're going to make this happen. But it's something about seeing on the clock a minute and a half left and knowing I've got to make this count. Not that they didn't have that mindset in the first quarter, but it's something about knowing that the end is definitely right there. I can see how much time's on the clock. And if it doesn't happen right now, it's not going to happen. We're not going to win. What's crazy is they actually scored with zero time on the clock. The scoreboard read 0, 0, 0, There was a penalty on the last play, so there was an untimed down, and so Stanford got one more chance. They took a snap with no time on the clock, and they knew right then we either do it now or it doesn't happen. Now I'm talking about football, but the, there's a there's a um, a lesson for life as well concerning when you see the end approaching, when you consider. What about when there's no more time to do whatever it is I want to do? Uh, and this is what I wanted to talk to you about. If you felt like your life, if the end were near, maybe you would consider probably more immediately about life after death. These circumstances in this situation is not something that um, is, is, uh, hasn't been popularized by Hollywood and entertainment, right? There's songs and movies that talk about this. There's a song, To Live Like You Were Dying. And in that song, he talks about, um, you know, I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. Maybe you've heard that song. Uh, the idea being live life to the fullest, right? Check off all these bucket list items. Now, for us, right, this is sort of a mindset that we should always have all the time, and that is we're never guaranteed tomorrow. So life after death should be something that's always on our mind. And not necessarily to live life to the to the fullest in the way that the world sees it, but to make every second count in our service to the Lord. Um, this is how I'm trying to motivate what I'm talking about this morning. We're not going to talk about that per se, but I do want you to consider the end of your life. And were you to have one last chance to speak to your loved ones? So imagine that for a moment. You've got 10 to 20 minutes to speak with a family member maybe to address the church one last time, a child of yours or a young person that looks up to you, a friend of yours, you got 10 to 20 minutes. What are you going to talk about? What would you say to them? I thought about this too. And I mean, I think it'd be natural to reminisce with them, 
to think about the good times that you have with them, to smile with them one last time. But if you knew that I never get to talk to you again, I would imagine that at some point your talk would get a little more serious, right? You never get to instill wisdom in them ever again. This is it. This is what they're, and they'll probably remember this last talk with you even more. What would you say? What would characterize your last words with these people? Can you think of two or three bullet points? Like I'm definitely going to hit these things. How would you approach that talk? <clears throat> This is what I wanted to talk about this morning. You can go through the entire Bible. I think it'd be an interesting study to go through the entire Bible and look at every single time you see a person die, what's the last thing that they say? Or if they had an opportunity to address a group of people or a person, what did they say to them? Sometimes there's good examples, sometimes there's not so good examples, but we can learn from it and it'd be an interesting study. We don't have time this morning to go through all of them. Um, some honorable mentions that I had had written down was Stephen, right? In Acts 7, you remember that? What was what was Stephen's last few words on earth? He preached Jesus to Jewish opposition. They didn't like what he had to say when he showed them from prophecy, from Old Testament scripture, who Jesus was and that he was the Messiah that was prophesied about. And they stoned him to death. And his last words were, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That's the last thing that we see recorded at least. It says something about his character and some stuff that we can learn about. One from the Old Testament, maybe that you're a little less familiar with, is Samson. And I didn't realize this until I had, had looked into this more. Remember Samson's last moments on earth? He was with a big, like 3,000 Philistines, enemies of God. They were all worshiping Dagon, pagan world. They were mocking God's mind at the time. Do you remember what, and, and Samson asked for his strength, the last words recorded by Samson, you remember what they were? Was it, let these Philistines die? It wasn't actually. It was, let me die with these Philistines. Now, Samson's not someone that everything he did, we can always look up to, but there's something to be said about what he realized. In order for me to bring about the destruction of this pagan worship that's happening right now, it's going to cost me my life. So take me down with them. Give me the strength to do this one last time. We're going to look at, um, I wrote down so many examples. There's no way we get to them all today. We've got 17 minutes. So we'll just get through as many as we can. Um, maybe five. Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, and Samuel. I want to hit those five. I doubt we may not get to Samuel. But I want to look at each of those people's last words and try to, to learn something from them. I'm going to try to connect them all with three points. Here's something that each of them sort of did in a way. They call you to remember, don't ever forget what God did for you. Two, because of that, be faithful. You stay faithful. And three, keep the word close to you. Those are the three things. So for our first one, if you've got your Bible, I didn't make a PowerPoint. And then I, I, I just realized, you know, may, maybe I should have gone new school. I went old school. Hopefully you've got your Bible uh, and we're, it, it's going to be really helpful for you to turn to these places. So the first place we're going to go to is Genesis chapter 48. Genesis chapter 48. This is going to be looking at when Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, died. Remember where they are right now at the end of his life. Are they in Canaan, in the promised land? Not anymore. They're in Egypt. So in chapter 48, verse 1, now it came about after these things, Joseph was told, behold, your father is sick. Joseph knows he's old, he gets sick, he's probably going to die soon. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. And when it was told Jacob, behold, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel, that is Jacob, collected his strength, and he sat up in bed. So he's got his grandsons coming, he's going to say something to them. He starts talking to Joseph, and he begin look where he starts. He begins with a reminder about a promise that God had made. Verse 3, J Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and numerous, and I will make you a company of peoples and will give this land to your descendants after you for an everlasting possession. So the first thing he starts with is, do you remember when God promised me this, he recalls that dream that he had at Luz with, you know, the angels going up and down the ladder and multiple times in that dream, God uh, revisits this promise 
that had to do with descendants and this land. And he reminds Joseph of that. He continues on, look in verse 8 and 9. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Joseph said to his father, they are my sons, whom God has given me here. So he said, bring them to me that I may bless them. He continues through chapter, uh, through verse 20 there, blessing uh, his grandsons. He acknowledges that God has brought about this event where he's been able to see his grandsons. He's thankful for that, and he gives God that glory. And he finishes in verse 21. This is what he, what he says to Joseph at the end here. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. I give you one portion more than your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. So he finishes by saying, God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. I don't see this as a trivial statement. And here's what, think about where they are. They're in Egypt. And they grew up hearing my grandpa, Abraham, was visited by God and told this would be our land. He came to me in a dream. This is supposed to happen. And then all of a sudden they go to Egypt. You can see how that would have been discouraging, thinking this is altering the promise. But he finishes saying, well, I guess it's not going to happen now, but I'm fa God's faithful and it will happen. And he tells Joseph it's going to happen. Let's look at our next example. Flip over to, to chapter 50. At the very end of the book. So Israel's already died. After he dies, you know, his brothers, uh, Joseph's brothers get worried, like he's going to be vengeful towards us. He tells them, you meant, you meant it for evil, but God intended it for good. The last words I want to look at start in verse 22. Now, Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons. Also, the sons of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you will carry my bones up from here. A very similar last statement to Jacob, his father. He could have reasoned, well, my dad, Jacob, told me that, you know, we were going to go back. But obviously it didn't happen. He thinks to himself, well, it's just not in my lifetime. And he remains confident because God made the promise. God is faithful. Therefore, I will be faithful. And he encourages his brother in this faith. Uh, this event in particular is, is revisited in the, I guess, quote unquote, hall of fame of faith in Hebrews 11, verse 22. It says, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel. And gave orders concerning his bones. So, so, so far in, the, in these first two examples, it's a, it's a strong reliance on faith, encouraging the people to remain faithful. Our next example, we'll look at Moses. This is in Deuteronomy. So turn to Deuteronomy chapter one. Now, this is incredibly long. Deuteronomy is basically three speeches that Moses gave. We're not going to read them all. What I'm going to do is try to go through it pretty quickly to try to follow along with each of these verses. And I'm going to make it it's incredibly difficult to miss the point that Moses is trying to get across. He is so repetitive. Um, but the repetition is to drill home this point of Israel. Don't you ever forget what God did. Remember where they are right now. They're just east of Jericho across the Jordan. Moses is 120 years old. He's speaking to men and women who were at most 59. Some There were 40-year-olds who didn't live through the Exodus. They had only been told about this thing that happened crossing the Red Sea. And Moses is like, if anyone understood the power and the might of God firsthand, it was Moses. Nobody else wanted to go up to Sinai. Moses went up on top. Moses understood it. And he is pleading with these men and women, you stay faithful. I've been there. I've seen it. These wanderings all read the book of numbers up and down the complaining. And he's saying, here's what you need to do. Don't you ever forget what God did. I'm telling you, he's faithful. You stay faithful and keep this word close to you and you'll be fine. That's your recipe for success. So the first speech is Deuteronomy chapter one uh, uh, through chapter four. The way that Moses starts is he reviews history in chapter one through verse three. Uh, look at look at Deuteronomy one six. The Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb saying, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn, set your journey, and go to the hill country of the Amorites, 
and to all their neighbors. Skip down to verse eight. See, I have placed the land before you. Go in and possess the land, which uh, the Lord your God swore to give to your fathers. The plan was never to wander. They were supposed to leave Egypt, cross the Red Sea, get the Ten Commandments and the law, and go into the land and take it. It was never the plan to wander. And God was going to be with them to do that, but the Israelites complained. Moses explains this to them. Uh, they, they visit the land. They spy out the land, and they were discouraged. Look at verse 26. You were not willing to go up, but you rebelled against the command of your Lord God. Moses says you shouldn't have. You should have remained confident. Look at 29. I said you don't be shocked or fear them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf, just like he did for you in Egypt. Uh, but they didn't listen. Verse 32. But for all this, you did not trust the Lord your God. And so the consequences. Verse 34. So the Lord, the Lord heard the sound of your words, and he was angry and took an oath, saying, Not one of these men, this evil generation, shall see the good land which I swore to give to your fathers. He goes on to recount the wilderness wanderings. <clears throat> And then before he goes into his second speech, uh, he calls them to obey Torah. That's basically what chapter four is. Look at chapter four, verse one. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I'm teaching you to perform, that you will live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Look at verse nine and ten. Give heed to yourself. Keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen. Don't forget, Israel. And so that they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Remember the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. When the Lord said to me, assemble the people to me that I may let them hear my words. So they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on earth. And that they may teach their children. This is going to be your recipe for success, Israel. Remember God. Don't forget. Keep that fear. Keep that respect and reverence. And you'll be fine. The second speech is uh, chapters 5 through 28. It's a lot of laws, some new laws, and but peppered in all throughout those laws is this repetition of don't turn to the left or the right. Don't add or take away. If you obey, there's blessings. If you don't, there's curses. And it's so repetitive. You wonder if the people sitting there listening are going, Moses, you just said this. But he's drilling this, home point, th this point home like, because it's so important. Uh, in chapter 5, he first revisits the Ten Commandments. Let me just point you to verse 15. In talking about keeping the Sabbath holy, he says, You shall remember you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath. The Sabbath was not to be observed without remembrance. The point was to reflect and remember what God had done for them. Um, now, Chapters 12 through 28 is when the, when sort of the law comes. But before he gives that, he gives sort of this preface to doing that. He's going to prep them to handle all these laws that he's getting ready to detail. And he's saying in, in keeping these laws, you need to remain loyal, Israel. Okay. So uh, to, to summarize, look at chapter 6, verse 1. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. Uh, verse 2, so that your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, uh, that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall walk of them, uh, talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This last time Moses has to speak to them, he says, if you do anything else, you keep the word of God right here. Talk about them to your sons to your grandsons, write them everywhere. When you walk, talk about them. Before you go to bed, talk about them. When you wake up, talk about them. Keep the word of God close to you and you can't fail. And be careful to do it. Be diligent. It won't happen by accident. It has to be purposed. Be diligent in this act that I'm commanding you in. Look at chapter seven, verse nine. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant. God is faithful. 
What should be the result of that? Verse 11, therefore, you keep the commandment and the statutes and the judgments, which I'm commanding you. God is faithful, therefore you be faithful. Look at 17 and 18 of chapter 7. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. What should you do? You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. Chapter 8, verse 1. All the commandments that I'm commanding you today, you should be careful to do, that you may live and multiply. Verse 2, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you should keep his commandments or not. I've underlined remember and careful all throughout De Deuteronomy. So I, I, we might hit them all. Chapter 9, verse 6. Know then, it's not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this land to possess. You're a stubborn people. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you left the land of Egypt until you arrived at this place and have been rebellious against the Lord. Look to chapter 11, verse 18. You shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul. Find them as a sign on your hand, and they'll be as frontals on your forehead. What would you say if you have one last time to speak to people? You can't miss Moses' message. Look at verse 22. For if you are careful to keep all this commandment, which I'm commanding you, to love the Lord your God and walk in his ways and to hold fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you and will dispossess, uh, dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Be careful to do the work. You think Nadab? And Abihu wished they had been more careful. Or Uzzah had been more careful when considering how to carry the ark and everyone else that was with him. Or Achan con concerning the, the commandments and how they were supposed to handle the spoil following Jericho. Be careful or you will reap the consequences. <clears throat> now, chapter 12 through 28 is a bunch of laws. But like I said before, peppered in there is a, a bunch of wisdom as well. 1232. Whatever I command you, you should be careful to do. Do not add or take away from it. Chapter 15, verse 15. You should remember you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Chapter 16, verse 3. You shall not eat leavened bread with it. This is talking about Passover. Seven days you shall eat with it unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of Egypt in haste, so that you may remember all the days of your life when you came out of the land of Egypt. 1612, you should remember you were a slave in Egypt and you should be careful to observe these statutes. 1719, it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life. This is talking about the future king that they knew would come, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and the statutes. We could keep going. I'm going to flip to the, to the end, to his last address. Like I said, read Deuteronomy. It's impossible to miss what Moses is trying to get across. His last speech is chapter 29 and 30. In chapter 29, verse 2, he summons all Israel and says to them, you have seen, again, the first thing he goes to is remember. Let me start by reminding you what God has done. You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land. He continues to recount those things and look at verse 9. So keep the words of this covenant to do them that you may prosper in all that you do. He continues to talk about the consequences of disloyalty that would eventually come, but that God would be faithful to restore them in chapter 30. He finishes in, in verse 15 of chapter 30 saying, see, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. Skip down to verse Verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness to you today. I've set before you life and death. What's he talking about? I've commanded you to love God and to keep his word. There's two choices, life and prosperity, death and consequences. If you do what I've said, if you love God, if you keep his commandments, life and prosperity, else death and consequences. Moses, in his last words, called Israel to remember, do not forget what God did for you. He is faithful, so you remain faithful and keep the word close to you and you'll be fine. For the sake of time, we'll do one more. Turn to Joshua chapter 23. Look at Joshua's last words here. Joshua 
Joshua gives two addresses, one in chapter 23 and one in chapter 24. In 23 verse 1, it says, Now it came about after many days when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies on every side. Joshua was old and advanced in years. Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders and their heads and their judges and their officers, and he said to them, he starts his speech, how? I'm old and advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God did to all these nations because of you, for the Lord your God is he who has been fighting for you. He starts with reminding them what God has done for them. The result of this is, Israel, therefore be firm. Verse 6, be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. It sort of sounds like Moses. This is Joshua. That you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or the left. Instead, do what? Cling to it, verse 8. But you are to cling to the Lord your God forever as you have done this day. And why? Well, remember, verse 9, for the Lord has driven out great and strong nations from before you. And as for you, no man has stood before you this day. So be diligent, verse 11. So take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. Concludes in verse 14. Now behold, today I'm going all the way of the earth. You know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you. Not one of them has failed. God has been faithful. You can see that now. Therefore, you be faithful. Our scripture reading this morning was the first part of his second speech. And wasn't that just a listing of all the things that God had done from Egypt and the Red Sea and the wilderness wanderings and Balaam? You didn't even see God working for you with Balaam and Balak, but he was. And so he concludes in chapter 24, verse 13 of his second speech. Now, this was the last part of our reading. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, cities which you had not built, and you have lived in them. You're eating of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. The benefits you're reaping now are not because of anything you did. It's because, remember Jacob way back when and Abraham? It's coming. He's faithful. And the promise has been fulfilled. Verse 14, now therefore fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today who you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He tells them to serve God in sincerity and in truth. How do you serve in truth? It's got to do something with the way that your heart is, but also in accordance with the word. In Joshua's last address, he says, don't you forget what God did for you. He's faithful, therefore you be faithful. Keep the word of God close. I have notes here for Samuel and for David, <clears throat> but we could do all of them. I, I had notes for Paul, too, in, in 2 Timothy. The conclusion's the same. Here's the point. Be faithful. Don't you ever forget what God did for you and keep the word close. All of those are connected too. They sort of build on each other. We are faithful when we remember. God instituted the Lord's Supper, a weekly reminder to remind us what Jesus did for us. That should be our motivation. A daily reminder. Go to God in prayer and remember those things and let that be your strength. We remember when we study God's word. And when God's word is close to us, we are strong. Remember Moses' message? Keep it all around you. Wake up. Think about it. When you're walking, think about it. When you're, you know, all the time to have God's word close. Um, I wanted to finish in, in, uh, in Moses' address in chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. It read, Know then it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God has given you this good land to possess. Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. We were a sinful people, and a similar message Paul addresses in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Anil read from 5, 8 this morning, starting in verse 6 of Romans 5, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own Lord toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So remember that. Don't forget. Let that be your motivation. Um, you know, I get, to, to develop an invitation to conclude this, we haven't even talked about Jesus' last words, but we could study those in depth and, and perhaps often do. In Luke chapter 22, verse 42, Jesus says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. 
I know what's coming. I know the death that's coming yet. Yeah, not my will, but yours be done. At the end, Jesus concluded it's not about me in his fleshly circumstances. It's about the father's will be done. Luke 23, 34 on the cross with his dying breath, he says, father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Christ went to the cross for our sins. And just like Moses reminded the Israelites, don't forget, you provoke the Lord to anger. It's not because of anything you've done that you're getting this land. The gift of God is gracious. It's not because it's not uh, anything that we deserved. It was a gift. And then finally, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, he concludes speaking to the, to the disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He gives this final commission to the disciples and one that's relevant for us as well. Uh, Jesus prayed this price that all um, that we all owed but could not pay. Paul says uh, we need to crucify the old man. The old man can be crucified to the world and the world to you if you're buried with him in baptism. If you need to be baptized, if you're struggling or if you have questions, and ask someone, and we're here to help you. Uh, if you're subject to the invitation this morning, please come forward as we stand and sing.